Hi, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me try that again. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Richard Byrne. Welcome to the uh, final. Uh, yeah, I've totally butchered this intro. Let me try one more time. Good afternoon, and welcome to the. Uh, presentation of the practice our presenter for this session is brian hayward brian is a choir director and technology integration specialist kind of a cool combination and he's here to talk to us today about video and using video as a reflective collaborative and data collecting tool so i'm really excited about this one as you know i love all things video so i'm excited to see what brian shares with us in this webinar uh, speaking of videos and webinars this is being recorded so anything you see on the screen you'll be able to go back and watch later uh, i'll have all of the recordings available by the end of the day tomorrow no promises on getting them done tonight uh, but most of them be, they should all be to be available tomorrow either on my youtube channel or at practicaledtech.com Excuse me, I was just trying to cram in a little snack and I have caught something in my throat. All right, so on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Please use the Q&A function in GoToWebinar to ask Brian questions. If he misses one, I'll make sure he gets it by the end of the session. So just give me one moment and I'll turn it over to Brian. Give me just a quick little switch here and you'll see my screen go away and Brian's screen will pop up in just a minute here. Hello? Hey. You're can good you hear to go. me? We hear you. Okay. Awesome. 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 Okay. I uh I'll share my my um webcam for just a second to say, hey, I'm not gonna leave it on. You can probably hear that my voice is gone. And I know it's a bit ironic for quiet teacher. It's been gone for about two weeks. I was sick a few weeks ago and so um I haven't really shut up because I'm in the middle of performance season. So it's been having a hard time coming back, but I'm not going to leave the webcam on the whole time because we're going to watch uh, a couple of these um, things that I want to show you. And that's when I'll cough up along if I need to. So uh, let me jump into this and I won't hold you forever. Let's go ahead and present. And I'm going to uh, turn the webcam off. So this is using video as a reflective, a collaborative and a data collecting tool. Um, I'll be honest, I, as a an arts teacher, okay, and that's how I'll, I'll sort of present this, um, I sit in meetings all the time, and with the push of the technology tools um, in our particular school district, I teach in a small semi-rural, it's becoming a lot more populated in the last 10 years, but um, I, I teach in a small rural area, and uh, our community has been, you know, they've been hesitant to change what we understand understand we need to change and so sitting in with teachers uh the arts teachers have often found it very uh cumbersome and they find it a bit irrelevant it's it's almost as if i was reading one music teacher band teacher was saying hey you know i can i run my program great we're winning awards we're winning competitions why do we need to use the more technology than we already use? We don't, we don't need the stuff. We can do everything without it. And of course, I am against using technology for the sake of using technology. If it's not going to help life become more efficient, if it's not going to help to reach uh, and expand the, the collaboration between the student and the teacher, or the collaboration between the students, or if it's not going to tap into a deeper level of creativity or even open up an area of reflection, something for the student that's got to be beneficial uh, for them, and it's also got to be beneficial for me. And so uh, I've kind of, in the last six, seven years, have kind of um, delved into this area of using technology in my classroom effectively. And there are some things that I'll try in my classroom that just don't work, but uh, this, over the last two years or so, video has absolutely just, it's impacted the way I do things. It has allowed me to become way more efficient within the class time okay and i say that because of course where i gain more class time uh, because students are using video and when i'm talking about using video i'm not referring to them necessarily playing someone else's video i'm talking about the use of them creating their own video um so when i have used that in my classroom 
I have found that I can keep teaching, I can keep doing group work, large group assignments, and students can actually intermittently leave my large classroom and go into a practice room or have a little foyer in the front of my classroom before you hit the hallway. Um, I guess they built that thinking that uh, in the choir, if they weren't sounding good, nobody would have to hear it. But um, we use that. I can send students in there to go and record things for me, individual assessments and individual assignments, uh, and they can submit those. I can grade those on my own time or in planning time. Um, I can grade those and play those. If I'm listening for audio, I can play it in the, in in the car and just press play and while I'm driving just hear the different kids as they sing and pick out kind of what I need to pick out and then when I get to my destination I can write down go through and look and see write down all the kids and write down what issues and things they had and what they need to go back in and fix so it really has helped out drastically uh, for me as a an arts teacher and um I a couple of years ago I'll um there we go uh, so this is my family. Uh, this is my wife, Rachel, my two daughters, Mackenzie and Melody. Mackenzie is the older one here, my Shug Nugget, and of course my youngest baby, Melody, who we sometimes call Wawa. Um, I uh, got married about four years ago, and um, actually I have two boys through foster care, which are not pictured here, Tyreek and John, that I have, they're older and adult, so it was like starting over for me when I got my two little ones, but um, really when my kids, my boys were in middle school and high school when they came to me um, out of foster care, and so they were starting in the school district to give them computers, they were starting to give them all of these uh, devices. As a matter of fact, while they were working through things at our school district, uh, it seemed that it was a buy the product first, then see if it works later type deal. So my students ended up having different devices almost every year. One year, a teacher said, she said, I teach multiple grade levels at the high school. I have an iPad, I have a Chromebook, I have a PC, and then I have a netbook. Uh, and so she said, because in order to get all of the kids uh, you know, uh, to dealt with so that I can see what they're doing, so I can absolutely view and and um, and add that on. I need all those devices. So after a while, we finally got things uh, um, straightened out, and I started working with some of the technology folks. And I still work with the technology folks in between uh, my time as a husband and as a dad and as a teacher and a choir director. And there's 50 other jobs that I do uh, also. So uh, this is my beautiful wife, Rachel. And uh, I love her. She has been very patient because I'm also in my uh, doctoral studies right now, too. So she's been been an amazing um, uh, teammate and she's been grateful. She's not feeling well now. So um, she's at home now. And when I leave her, I'll go get her and the babies. So uh, let's talk about we're going to talk about why video. We're going to talk about video as a reflection tool. Video as a collaboration tool. Video as a data collection tool. And then um, some tools and some ideas maybe to help you kind of flesh this thing out and uh, it is my hope and my goal that as I describe some of what I do maybe you can find a spot to describe uh, um, or excuse me to fit video in in something that you're doing maybe you can figure out a way to help use a video as an impactful part of your curriculum uh, it is not the goal of technology to make it more cumbersome and to make it more laborsome it is the goal of technology to improve efficiency uh, also to tap into um, bigger goals of, of creativity and to make accessible to students things that may not have been accessible uh, using other different ways and video is a great way to do that so let's jump in why video this is just a snippet i wrote uh originally when i was um, starting to write my dissertation, and I'm in the middle of that process, just pray for me. Uh, I did not include video. And we actually, with a, one of my supervising professors, we talked about some of the dangers of video. We talked about whether or not we felt that would be an acceptable form of data collection. It's a fairly new form of data collection, uh, whether or not we felt like we could accurately um, uh, gain what we needed to gain through video that we weren't gaining through other methods and other instruments. And so after uh, collaborating with some of my colleagues, we decided that what I was looking for for my my dissertation, um, which is really dealing with how students describe their use of technology in the music classroom and arts classroom, I really needed some of those uh, those facial cues and and the way that they described using certain technology tools, the way that they described the process and how to learn them, uh, all of those things needed to be vital when I was gathering data so that I got all of those things included in my data and got a full 
well-rounded picture. So I, I wrote this uh, really quickly, just one little little couple of sentences, that reflection is commonly been used to discuss thinking, learning, other metacognitive constructs since the early 20th century. Uh, using video as a medium, it's only been prevalent in the last about 40 years or so. One of the benefits, and of course, when it was used, it was used where, you know, you would uh, watch someone else's video, they would use video as a tool, uh, someone else that had created the video. But one of the vid benefits of using video as a tool, and I'm talking about recording your own video, is that it will capture an authentic visual characteristic or visual characteristic that cannot be captured by most other, any other collection tool. And what I mean by that is you're like, okay, well, well why can't I just take a picture? The problem is, is that pictures don't allow much context. Uh, they really don't. When you look at them, you really do have to assume, and pictures are great. Pictures are absolutely important uh, for evidence. Pictures are, are very important uh, to give us sort of a visual of what's going on and what's happening. They connect us with this. But video really does take this to steroid level. Like it really pumps it up. It really just goes ballistic. Uh, what I like to tell my students, it just megatrons it. It just, it just goes to the next level um, is what it does. And so uh, I heard one person um, was talking about Dr. James McQuivy. He said, if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a video has to be worth at least 1.8 million words. And uh, I'll share this presentation at the end. So if you want to see literally how he came up with that figure, he has an actual equation that he came up with. But one of the things that is important for us to recognize as educators is that our current social environment, it is priming our students for the use of video. Uh, and, and it is, it will be, uh, it, it has in the last 10 to 15 years, students are very used to sharing. And as I said, they are oversharing. Uh, we know this because if any of us have um, Facebook, if any of us have other social media accounts, you know, you scroll down and you see some pretty cool things. You get to stay connected with people. And then there's, there's usually that one that one young person that you got, whether it's a cousin, a kid, a cousin's kid, or whether it's just somebody else, a former student or whatnot that you uh, are friends with, and they overshare. Uh, they they overshare about, you know, the fight they're having with their spouse or their um, or their partner, or they just, and you're like, wait a moment, don't put all this out on social media. Like, don't, don't do all this. Uh, and so we have this um, we have this culture where students are becoming extremely comfortable with video. Now, I will be honest, when I first started using video, when our students were issued Chromebooks, I didn't know how they would react and how they would respond. What I found out was, was that students actually felt more at ease in conversing uh, or even in talking with me, but in, in conversing with students around them, uh, they were having full-on conversations while the video was running. And the crazy part is, is they posted it. Like they just, they literally posted it as part of their assignment because even though they may have sung a song for me or had to do an exercise for me, or even had to reflect about something uh, or giving me back some information to make sure I know that they've got it, a quick check, they decided to go off and have a conversation right there in, in the video. And then of course they came back to what the video was about. So. Students I found were becoming extremely at ease with using video and it gave me an opportunity for some insight. It also gave me an opportunity for them to be uh, a lot more a lot honest, a lot more honest at how they really felt about certain things, what they really were struggling with. Uh, and then sometimes it uh, made them confront their own challenges or issues with an assignment that I may have given them and what they felt was the was the hardest part. I'm a big believer in process. And, and what I say by that is, I always tell my students when it comes to our singing, and I teach both choir and I teach general music. So I teach non-band instruments. I teach drum set, I teach keyboard, uh, a piano keyboard. I teach uh, uh, guitars, ukuleles, harmonicas. I teach the, a, a number of things there. Um, ukuleles is like the new phase, that it's the new fad that everybody's going crazy over. So um, when I teach these things, I always tell my students, if you don't hear that something is wrong or know that something is wrong or see that something is wrong, if you're not going to take it in that something is wrong, you cannot fix it because you don't know to fix it. Also, the adverse is true, right? That, that if you don't see that something is going right, that something really came out well, that, that a certain chord that you've been practicing on an instrument, any of those things, if those things are doing well, then you may accidentally change something that's working for you, something that's really doing well, something that you didn't realize when you were recording 
that you'll realize when you actually watch it back. So it's been an opportunity for students to get honest with themselves. What the crazy part is, even when I see my kids' responses, it's usually not their first or second response, because I always tell them, don't submit your first response. When you record, go back and watch it, figure out how to make it better, how to make your response better. I have some guidelines that I use, and I'll show you a little bit um, uh, when we get to that section there. So uh, another thing is that it, in, it absolutely requires engagement by the student. Uh, it keeps their attention span. It absolutely re just retains their attention span when they're creating video. Now, it doesn't mean that they stay on topic all the time, okay? but they do realize that the camera is on. And, uh, and it's amazing. Some of them are just so, they're amazed by being amazed that they see themselves. Like they're just, oh, wow, oh my gosh, and how they respond and how they act. So that has been cool uh, to see some of my students who are even quiet uh, to see them come out. Um, another thing, of course, as I just said, video allows much better context for what it is the response that you're getting. It allows students to be able to expound on what they're thinking, um, on that metacognitive process. It allows students to be able to explore their own feelings and their own ideas. Uh, and that is important because that is the culture that we are in. Um, and so that's very important that we, that we not only um, do things to foster that, but that we do things to teach our kids how to, to, uh, how to share um, effectively. I put in here that careers in video are growing and increasing. It seems that everything I'm watching nowadays uh, I literally am surprised because I remember like, for example, years, you know, teachers would say, hey, stop playing all those video games at home or your parents would say that it's going to fry your brain and you can't make no money off of it. Well, we're finding that that's not true. Same thing is stop making all those selfies, stop recording yourself. You know, you can't make no money. Go get a real job. Go well, that is content creation is a real job. It is a real career and people, young people are figuring out how to absolutely monetize that in a robust manner and a robust way, even the negative sides of that. Um, of course, I'm not gonna list any any folks that may be popular on things like YouTube uh, and things on, on other settings, but I will say that young people especially, they are figuring out how to pay bills using video and, and creating content uh, on the internet. So we can no longer say that, but what we can do is teach our students how to become respectful, how to become responsible, uh, to make sure that we teach them how to be wise, how to be diligent in what they do, uh, how to make sure that there are some things that are no-no, some things that are guarded, some things that they should consider before sharing, uh, that they should take time to contemplate, reflect on before they share. Some things that they need to just let simmer for a while before they press that upload button. Uh, those are all parts of what video can absolutely do. And, and the more that we include it in our classroom, the more that we inherently don't have to preach to our kids about uh, these different things with video, the more we can actually have them using it, implementing the skills on digital citizenship when it comes to videos. One of the biggest things we talk about with videos uh, with my students, we talk about, listen, when you post it, it's there. It is there. It's there. It's absolutely there. Okay, you can press unpost, you can press whatever you want to press down, it's there. And if somebody snagged it, if somebody uh, screencasted or recorded it, uh, any of those things happen, it's going to live there in infamy. Uh, and we all know, of course, there are some things that we see. I think about just some of the, the online Facebook stories about you know a dog or a cat or a person doing this or whatever that shows up seven years, eight years later. That story is still being shared by people. And you're like, what? What, why is this story still? It's there. And so to teach students to become responsible uh, with the video, this is a great atmosphere where they are enclosed, where uh, it's not going to hurt them and harm them for them to test out ideas, for them to get comfortable using video in a responsible way and in a way that adds value, not just to their education, but to the educational context uh, that you're in, whether that's in a classroom, in a K-12 classroom, whether it's in higher education, whether it's in a social group, any of those things are areas where they can, can go through. Okay, so video is a reflection tool. Because of the pendulum shift in the last 10 to 20 years, right, we know at one point in time, um, you know, we, we had it where um, you weren't really supposed to share everything. You weren't really supposed to talk about it. You really weren't supposed to, to do that. And we know of some of the issues that have been shared in, in further than 20 years. But in the last 10 to 20 years, there has been a shift or an emphasis on expression. Okay? And it has come into the forefront. Um, it, it's caused our students and even 
folks that are in my generation, generation behind me, uh, folks that are in, my mom is, is an amazing social media, like she does more stuff than I do on social media. It has caused them to become more uh, socially aware. It's caused them to become more socially active, to use social media, uh, to increase their activity in different genres, different areas of, of life. Um, and so it's, there's a number of things that we have seen um, when it comes to video being used as a reflection tool. Now, how does this work in a classroom, okay? In a classroom, video is an amazing reflection tool because of students being able to respond back to a prompt that a teacher or another student may have, or even to create prompts themselves uh, that may be used for them and may be used for classes that come after them, for students to respond back to those things and then reflect on the process or reflect on what they said, go back and watch themselves and, and sort of really um, give their best response and their best reflection. So using video in order to allow students to reflect makes them slow down, it makes them think. Now, the first time or the first couple of times when you're using video, you are not going to get, uh, you're not gonna get great responses probably, most likely. It's gonna take, time. It's going to be a process. Uh, I will be honest with my sixth graders. I teach at a middle school. When my sixth graders come in and we do this for the first time, my first little assignment that they do, and it's like 30 seconds that they have to do, it's, it's basically a waste. It is, it just gets them comfortable with using video uh, is what it does. And so it's a beginning assignment. We usually do it within the first two days of class and it just gives them an opportunity. I teach kids in my music classes on a rotation of every 45 days. And then I teach my chorus kids uh, all year long. I have them every day all year long. So I really do get to kind of see uh, some of the things that work better long term, some of the things that are working better short term, some of the things that I got to cut. And I'm not there yet. By no means are we there yet. But but we're working through those things. And so they're teaching me as well as, of course, I'm learning from them and, and, and I get to teach them. Okay. The other thing is video really as a reflection tool can be great in the iterative pro progression. Okay. When you are working with your students to create a story, when you are working with your students to create some kind of product, when you are working with your students on problem-based learning, uh, when you're working with your students in any of those contexts and more contexts, in my classroom, we're working on a piece of music, we're working on um, a composition that they're creating in, in a percussion class, or they're writing their blues songs, um, and we're really focusing on the emotions of the blues, uh, or we're learning how to play the piano and we're using popular songs to help us kind of develop certain skills, whatever it is that we're doing, reflecting back on those things really does give the student a time to pause, okay? And what's interesting is, is I allow my students for most of their formative assessments, most of their formative things, I allow them to reproduce those things for the most part, okay? I allow them to, uh, for a video that's not done correctly, I limit my videos, which we're gonna get into talking about so that they don't take up all my time to view them. Uh, so I have six classes going at the same time, and so I may have three videos going, or I may have six sets of videos that are gonna be submitted. So uh, I limit mine, and, and of course, like I said, I let them play during the certain things I'm looking for within their video that they're covering um, and that they're tapping into. And so you'll see a little bit of that on, on some of the progress um, or excuse me, some of the rubrics and, and assignment details or some of the things I'm trying to tap into and get them to tap into. But we really get to teach them to stop, to pause, go back, to watch it again, to make sure that this accurately represents what you were trying to say. One of the other things that, um, that I use in this reflective tool, is, and you'll see as we go into this, is I connect parents with uh, their online portfolio. And many of their videos, some they don't, but many of their videos, they end up posting on their online portfolios. And so when I use video, I want you to know I don't use video every day. I don't. I may use video uh, every other week. It's what we may do uh, an assignment or do something on there. There are some extra credit things that I'll do with video where they record themselves, even with them rehearsing. When I am either grading or looking at some of those things, I can fast forward through a lot of it because I just need to see that they're engaging in the process. And if I get them engaging in the process by recording themselves, engaging. In the process, then I know that the, the product that's going to come, if I see that they're doing something wrong, I can help them and fix it. I can write comments back and say, hey, you're not using direct, the correct breast support, or make sure that you're following these, uh, these examples, or make sure you're giving yourself the right starting pitch. All those things I can identify through video 
instead of when I have, you know, a number of them in class and we're having to sing through a piece or we're having to learn uh, something for a performance. So it really allows me to individually get contact or connection with my students. And so I wanna encourage you to consider in whatever subject or discipline it is that you teach to consider video as a reflection tool from your students to even allow them to reflect by video before they turn around and go back and write it. Uh, it is a great opportunity for them to hear back what they are saying and even to see themselves. And, and some of them, they're gonna laugh, they're gonna giggle at first, they will. Uh, and they're like, oh, I don't like the way I look, oh, I don't. It, that's gonna happen. But as they grow and as you progress with them in, in the use of video, most of your videos may just be a part of the process. You may never publish it. They may never put it on an online portfolio of any sort. They may never even really keep it. You may never see some of it. Some of it may just be for them and a partner to, to view and to give uh, feedback, to critique any of those things, whatever the content is that you are recording or whatever the reflection is that's going on. So just wanna encourage you to, to uh, consider that. So um, one of the, uh, sample assignments that I use is a course description video assignment. So at the beginning of the year, uh, my students, they bring home, uh, or actually I send out by email and I send home uh, by paper and by, of course, text message to the ones that are connected, uh, an opportunity for parents to sign up for their kids' online portfolios. And, and this is sort of my way to connect with parents, but really for parents to connect with their students. So we're going to get into a little bit of using online portfolios, and I'll, I'll show you what I use and, and for me, why my choice was that particular one. Um, and so uh, when they do that, they sign up and they have to create a course description video assignment. This video assignment is usually anywhere from about two minutes to two minutes and 50 seconds. I don't watch all of the videos as far as watching them all the way through. I can look on the screen and see while I fast forward that they've covered all of the areas in there, that they've missed some things. I can tell when they've missed the, the, the they didn't um, remember to tell their parents to sign up for this um, because they just skipped past it or they never made it to it in the video. Um, I can tell those things by just simply fast forward. It takes five to 10 seconds to, to view through it. If I have a question, I'll pause and press play so that I can hear uh, what it is that's going on, what it is that's being said. And, and then of course, I'll grade accordingly. And it's just a small little grade that I give them at the beginning of the year to give them that beginning boost in my class. So the parents actually, when they watch this, when they sign up for my email, from the paper that they get home, they have this intro video from their student. The other amazing thing is, and this kind of goes in the data collection, is that those parents can then download that snapshot of their student at this age. And I always tell parents that because they don't realize it. You can download this, hold on to this, show it to the grandbabies someday, you know, pull it up at graduation, just snapshot them in this time because we all who have raised children, we know that they grow up so fast and so quickly. And so when I look even at my older boys now, they're in their early 20s. I remember when I first got them in their early teens. Uh, and so, I mean, they're just, they're so far advanced that I will send them, one's got a birthday coming up on the 14th. So I usually send him one of the incriminating videos that I have of him from over the years, and I'll just sneak that to him on the side. And sometimes I'll publish it uh, if it's not, a, not a, you know, anything that's going to be bad, but just something to just remind him uh, not to take himself too serious and to continue to laugh in there on his birthday. So, um, so it's a great opportunity when you do that. And I'll show you my, my um, rubric and the uh, directions for that course description assignment. Another assignment that I use is the uh, progress check assignment. This is where I have students, I'm not gonna show you this because of course it has students' grades on it, where they actually communicate with their parents about what their progress is in my class. These grades, uh, these uh, videos are on average about 30 to 45 seconds. I tell them there's, you really don't need anything more than 45 seconds to be able to share what's going on. You need to talk about what you're doing well in. They have to show certain things and you'll see that on the, um, the assignment rubrics. And then of course, uh, I also do this with the pass off reflections. Uh, and I'm gonna show you one of my students' videos. Uh, actually, I'll show you part of her video as a sixth grader, part of it as a seventh grader. Um, and then I don't remember if I have her as an eighth grader or not on here, but she's currently an eighth grader. And, uh, and so I've got permission to, to do that. Okay, so let me show you really quickly the course description assignment. And uh, this course description assignment, um, it gives them the objectives, it gives them, one of the things for arts teachers in South Carolina we have been charged with is uh, including or incorporating uh, media 
part standards in ours. So, uh, so some of them you'll see, I'll have the standards listed in their uh, instruction sheets. I know they don't care anything about that. So uh, of course I tell them, let's read the objective. What are you supposed to do? And then let's talk about the procedure of what you're going to do. So uh, they'll go through, I give them uh, examples and settings and you'll even see at the, um, it talks about how to submit your video, what to label it as. Uh, it'll talk about, there's a least posted as links. And I'll share with you why a little later, why we do the links and why I don't post the video directly to uh, Seesaw or to any other online portfolio, but I embed it or link it uh, in there. And I'll, I'll share later about that. But we talk about that, submitting your video, posting it up. And, uh, and then even I give them a sample video that they can watch where I do it in class with them and show them. Because we all know when we finish telling teach, uh, students directions, Okay, so here's what we're going to work on today, blah, 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 ready to go, let's get started. And you get that hand that says, what are we supposed to do again? So this gives them that visual for them to kind of walk through and read it again. It also gives them a sample for them to kind of look through and see what, what did Mr. Hayward do? And, uh, and they can just use that, that generic video. So if you, you want to watch that, I'll show you how you can see uh, how you can see that and maybe put together your own one. And that's a work in progress. This has changed over the last couple of years. It will continue to change as software updates and as we um, utilize different things. Okay, so another thing, my progress checks, where they actually will talk about their grades in my class. These again are 30 to 40 second videos. These are not long videos, but it's an opportunity for them to reflect uh, on what's going on in their class. And so uh, I've got, of course, some of the general music standards and, uh, and things like that. I have choral standards, music standards, and then I, I try to incorporate media standards sometimes. So um, it even talks about what I don't, I don't wanna hear things like good, bad, or okay only. Uh, I wanna hear them articulate what it is that's going on in, in, in whatever it is that they're talking about. So when they review their uh, an assignment, if they're reviewing a grade, why they agree with the grade, disagree with the grade, with my course kids, you know, or my music kids, um, they can talk about when they disagree with it. Mr. Hayward, I really felt like I did try my best. I felt like my hand signs were really good and I don't agree with the grade because I've only been in your class this year, not like some of the other students who have been in your class in years before. So they really get an opportunity and a chance to kind of share and express. And if it's something that they can either redo or fix, I'll go and remind them. I'll say, hey, just keep working at it and you can still have until so-and-so to upload or submit a new one. Just email me, let me know once it's submitted, I'll go back in the system and regrade it for you. Uh, or if you wanna come see me, let's talk about it. And we'll talk about that and they'll get a chance to share and, and kind of defend their position. And I've had students to do that. So it's really been a way where if they didn't use this form, they probably would have never told me. They would have never said anything uh, to me. And it's a great way for me to find those things out. So I, of course I give them the guidelines, how to label their videos. I try to be consistent in how to label it. I try to be uh, consistent in how to check for their, um, for their uh, rubric and how to check for the progress, the things that I'm looking for. Uh, and I will write in their grade books, they did not follow the directions, the student didn't do this, the student said to check this, redo it, and then of course let me know and I will I'll resubmit it. Okay, so let me go back in and, uh, and I'll keep moving forward so we can get done quickly here. So we talked about it as a reflection or, and, and I put information because it really does inform you as the teacher. Uh, and it gives you an opportunity to see things about them, your students that you may not have seen. I set a pass off reflection here. I wanna show you just because these are my course kids. And actually, I just wanna show you, uh, my kids had to do a, um, uh, where they just had to talk. I actually didn't make them sing on this one. And they had to talk about uh, comparing two of their singing exams, which we call pass off. And so they explain, it's kind of interesting that this student brings in uh, some prior knowledge. This is a sixth grade student. You also will see that she chose to do her video, which we'll get into a little bit at the end, their um, autonomy and personal choice and their them setting their own sort of atmosphere where they're comfortable to record. So I don't know if you'll be able to hear this, but hopefully you will. Okay, so that was her statement. Um, and then actually the students respond back to each other, but um, this, uh, and you see this one chose to do it in her um, room also. Brian, it's not playing the sound through on our end. Is it not at all? Nope. Is that no, better or no? Okay. 
Let me go back and do this other one just so you can, because it wasn't long, her original one. Okay, so this particular student, um, it's a sixth grade student, beginning kid, uh, and um, you heard her use words like up at the time, by the time they get in eighth grade, they're using vocabulary like ascending, descending. It's, they're, they're using more of their music vocabulary within how they speak and how they talk. And those are some of the things that I expect from them as we grow and as we increase. This also, I don't know if you could see, but this was done in September. So this was right after school started here. Uh, we start in the middle to end of August. So this was done within the first couple of weeks of school where these students are brand new to me. And so um, you can kind of see they chose to kind of do this uh, but here's a student that actually disagreed with the other student's opinion and explained her reasoning why. Okay, all right, so you saw her throw in. Uh, we're in South Carolina and the two competing schools are, of course, uh, Carolina and um, Clemson uh, University. So you can see where they chose to kind of add in their own sort of you know, personality and their effects there. Um, but it was kind of cool to see, and, and I will go on and comment on some of these students, um, what they write and, and, and what they say in there. So just wanted to share that. Let's jump back in and we'll keep moving with where we're at. Uh, so. We've talked about using it to kind of reflect, to kind of gather information, uh, using it as a collaboration tool. Using video to collaborate can be an uneasy arena to travel in. Um, of course, I, you know, I told you when I was doing my, starting to write parts of my dissertation, uh, my professor was uneasy about the use of video period. But uh, in talking about who will have access, all of these things came up. And so um, with all of the news surrounding the increasing number of human trafficking, online bullying, school violence, adherence to COPA laws, um, FERPA, all that stuff, we have to be careful when allowing students access to collaboration tools and what they're being used for uh, in there. So one of the key things to look for is a walled garden. Um, and I try to look for that for sure in any uh, equipment that I use for video. And so them being able to stay away from the outside world and not have that access to the outside world is important for me. Okay, single sign-ons make it easier for students, but I will be honest that in order to protect their privacy and to make sure that there are um, that there are no leaks happening with personal information from their accounts, I tend to stay away from single sign-ons when possible for my own music stuff. Now they have their general, their, we're a Google district, so they have their general things that they use single sign-ons in, but I tend to stay away from it. I tend to use general classroom accounts. And these are generic accounts that I set up and I'll show you the, um, the, the site that I used to set it up. It's actually, it's a official original purpose was for people to give these emails out when they were forced to sign up, when you go to a new site or you want to do something, see a video, download something, whatever it is, and they make you sign up on their newsletter, but you don't really want to get the junk. And so basically it sets up this sort of fake email. You have an email account, but you can basically say anything at this email account and it will send it to this account that you don't even need to worry about setting up, but you can get in and access it if you want to. And you, uh, so it's just kind of a cool thing. So what I do is I have sort of a fictional email account. None of my students have access to it. I don't have, I, well, I have access to it, but I, I've never logged into it, don't need to. Okay, because I just needed to simply set up um, all of these, this class set of just fake accounts and it's like Stover Music Students, that's my school, is what it is. Stover stu Music Student One, Stover Student Music, uh, Music Student Two, so forth and so on. And then they have a generic password that's not, it's not a private password because everybody's using the same thing and nobody's disseminating or sharing personal information beyond just their name being on the top of their composition or their project that they're doing when they turn it in. So I tend to use those type of accounts 
uh, when doing video so that I, I mitigate some of the concerns of personal information uh, being used. So uh, Soundtrap is one that we use. If you've never heard of Soundtrap, it's pretty cool uh, software. I um, learned about it a few years ago, started playing around with it. It's great for podcasts, so you don't have to be a music person. It's great for podcasts, and podcasts are, are really great. It's audio, but it's really great for you to get those short uh, reflections. It's great for teaching tools um, in there. You can use video to do that also, but Soundtrap really does. You can create the audio side of it and then link it with video if you want to also in Soundtrap. But it has a... Uh, Sort of a collaborative feature and i'm going to tell you i'll just show you i signed into one of the kids accounts so um it has the ability for them to record themselves you can see that down here but it also has over here the ability for them to collaborate now you'll see here it says uh there's nobody collaborators there's nobody even though i have a class set of them i have closed off collaborative uh, abilities for them that is on purpose i don't feel like my students can handle that and manage that correctly uh, they would literally just talk to each other the entire class even though they were right there next to each other they would just use the video icon here to talk with their friends here on this side of the screen so i disabled that part and have been fine and okay with it and you do have to be careful when you're using um uh, the collaboration and using video to collaborate um, one of the things that i do love to use to collaborate between students and myself is google meet we at our middle school in our school district, we operate, uh, excuse me, South Carolina is working on an e-learning initiative. So our school district was um, basically it's to help avoid inclement weather days that students can still be active or semi-active at home when they're inclement weather days so that we don't have to keep planning um, extra days to make up. And of course, we all know it's important to have that class time, but if we can accomplish some things, and video is a great way to, to do that, to collect that data that you need from a student that you would either have with them. But if we can do that, of course, while students are at home on a, on a, a day that's an inclement weather day, we don't have to make it up next semester when they're not even in the same class anymore as when they were when there was a, a weather thing. So, um, so just that South Carolina sort of initiative. And I actually use, some teachers use Word, some teachers use, um, we have a Google Guardian, which is uh, one of our suites that helps to secure and allows teachers to see Chromebooks and what students are doing on Chromebooks. Um, I use Google Meet and I love Google Meet because the kids of course love seeing themselves through video. Uh, and when they see themselves through video, I'll, uh, I'll show you real quick uh, what it kind of looks like. It's not gonna let me access my camera, but because uh, it's on right now. But um, basically when you, um, when you open this up, and I think it'll tell me that it's going to error out on the camera. We'll see what it says there. Uh, let's see if it does. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's okay. So it's not going to let the camera because it's already being used uh, by GoToWebinar. But this allows our students to join, and I teach them everything from muting before they enter into our room. Uh, and, and they, on an e-learning day when they're having issues, uh, and we do practice days like this too. And it is feasible and possible. They can come on. There's a chat feature in there also where we can write down questions that we have, but they can. Keeping them um, disconnected from the outside world. And this is the old room, so nobody, we don't use this room at all anymore. But um, I just wanted to show you that you can use that. Flipgrid's a great way to kind of quasi uh, have collaboration. And I say that because you saw my Flipgrid that I just showed. They don't talk directly back and forth with each other, but they can absolutely build on ideas with each other. And that's something great to consider and just think about uh, when you're when you're using video and using it to collaborate. So I want to encourage you to think about to think about some of those. Okay, so data collection. This is actually where students can complete assignments, turn in things. I talked about where I would actually have students uh, uh, sing or where they would actually show compositions or show work that they have done and then they would turn that work in. This is great in data collection for um, uh, for getting to the affective domain. Okay, That visual aspect that is oftentimes missed in other data collection tools, it's there. You get to see them smirk their face up when they make a comment about a certain note or a certain measure or something that they found difficult. All of those things are included in that video that you get to see for yourself. And sometimes even when they're trying to make it as nice as they can, you see that initial reaction that they can't hide and that they can't stop. So this is great for you to be able to collect assignments when you need to collect assignments. And I wanna show you uh, really quickly, uh, this is a student 
they actually wrote and created online compositions. So of course, if you're writing a story, uh, if you're going through and talking about the research process and science or uh, doing um, some kind of timeline or anything in another subject area, they actually share their screen and we use Screencastify. So they used, uh, in this particular instance, NoteFlight. And she actually wrote it and I had them to sing it for me. I needed to see a little bit about their reading skills and I needed also to, um, to also help them with some pitch issues if they were having it. You're gonna notice that she has an earphone in her ear, uh, earbud, and that she's also gonna see this moving and going. And that is okay for me at this age. She was in sixth grade at this time. She's now in eighth grade, but she was in sixth grade, just starting, I'm okay with that. Okay, so I just wanna play a part of it. Okay, and I'm not gonna play the whole thing, but you get the idea. The crazy part is, is, of course, she created this composition herself, and then she had to then perform it after she got it approved by me. There were guidelines, of course, that on what she could do, skip things of that nature that she could include in her performance. Of course, by her trying this, because some of them will not practice, she did practice before, she recorded it, but some of them won't practice until they get the video recording, and then they just wanna jump in and do it. If they're messing up, if they're screwing up, this is a great way where I teach them, hey, I think you wrote this too hard. I think you wrote this way too difficult. Uh, and I think that you should simplify some parts out in there. I think you should use more rest. I think you, we can now have that conversation based on uh, um, this data collection that, that she submitted and turned in. And I always have them show me their things before they submit it, just to make sure that they feel like they're confident, they're comfortable, it's good to go. I really get to assess it. And then I get to tell them, maybe you should consider doing this, you should consider doing that. Actually, I think you did really well on this um, here, because this really, for me, is instead of having them sit in my classroom and sing all of these, I can have them work on this. They can choose to. This is my four year right here. So I'm teaching class. Okay? I'm going on with a piece of music or working on rhythm patterns with the entire class while this student steps out, records her piece, and then comes back in. The next student does the same thing. So it really does keep that part down. And then I get to see whether or not that student is getting it, where they're struggling at. Is it a pitch issue, a rhythm issue? I know I'm talking about music words, things of that nature. Okay. So I didn't mean to correct that. But it really does give me an opportunity to really capture uh, back their assignment. This is, um, I didn't play the beginning of that video, but like she giggles and chooses it. This is her a year later. You can see that the student has chosen, has made the personal choice because she feels comfortable to actually record this at home. Okay, that is a choice that I give them when they record their videos for me. They can record it at home. We talk about what's appropriate and what's inappropriate. Like, please don't record in front of your bathroom okay, and don't record while you're sitting on the toilet. And that's a real thing for my middle schoolers because they think it's hilarious. So um, we go over and we talk about that. If you've got younger brothers and sisters that are screaming all the time, home may not be the best place for you to record. It may be better for you to come and record in my classroom or to come in the morning or to go in the library and ask them if you can record or something in the side room. So those are all things that we talk about in, in how to record, how to get the best sound, how to go back and listen to and, and you know so forth and so on. Okay, so I'm not gonna play this one just for the sake of time. I'm gonna keep moving so I can get to this last one last uh, couple of slides here. And I hope that you found some way to incorporate your students. Now, if your students are not one-to-one, -one, that is okay, because using online portfolios, they actually can, um, they can all record on one device and then go to their and assign it to their particular account, if that's the way that you choose to do it. Um, or they can label it correctly by their name and submit it to a Google form. And then you've got that entire class of videos going on at the same time. I've got a band director friend who would set his iPad up before kids had Chromebooks, and he would let them go in and record their playing test and, um, in his office. And so he could see them, they would press record, say their name, blah, 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 blah come out, press stop button, come out, next kid go in, blah. So we had all these videos back to back to back that he could just watch on his iPad at home, watch when he's, you know, getting in bed, get ready to go to sleep, just watch a couple, grade it real quick or assess it real quick and, uh, and then hand back feedback to the kids the next day. So great thing to do. It's a great thing also for tutorials, teacher and student tutorials. You can create vocabulary, quick vocabulary tutorials. Let the students record their definition for terminology and give context by using it in a sentence, uh, you know, or describing it in a real context way. And then use it to build a library for your classroom uh, where kids can actually click on and use that in future times to come. You can replace it with better 
as you get better videos. And so it can even be a sense of, a, of, of an accomplishment if a student's video gets picked for the classroom library. All those things you can build in at every level that is appropriate. E-learning, I already discussed and talked about. It's a great way when you have kids on homebound, kids who are not at school for whatever reason, and they're doing school there, and you're having to put assignments together, and you're having to try to figure out a way to get information back from them and not keep it all worksheets. This is a great way. If they are available to do this, you can absolutely just simply collaborate through Google Meet, or you can have them record the assignment. Um, I had some students who were uh, dealing with battling cancer, and there was a time where they did not feel comfortable. That was okay. So we blocked their camera, we taught them how to block their camera, but they could still actually submit their percussion assignments by beating on the table next to the camera. We could hear it uh, and we could hear them saying it, clapping it, whatever it was that they were doing. And of course it was only viewable to me um, in there. I shared it with their parents so that their parents could have that snapshot uh, of their child of their child's work at that age. And so, um, so those are all some options and some things that you can think about. Okay, so uh, yeah, I think it's Things to know, this is great for use in blended learning scenarios. Okay, we talk about what you can send them home to do that they don't need to take time to do in class. Great to do this. I don't have to sit and send time for them to make all these videos. They can choose to do it at home. They can choose to go out intermittently and do this in my foyer room that uh, is a part of my classroom. Great for giving students some autonomy, autonomy in their video creation um, and how they do it. I have some students who will use the, I don't use the drawing tools, but some kids will use the drawing tools and draw when they're circling grades. They will X out grades they don't like and don't want their parents to see as if that's going to help or hurt. But um, they, you know, they will do all kinds of things on there. So they, they really do make this and personalize it. You've got to be careful of the time limits. They can go on forever. I limit most of my videos to about 30 to 45 seconds in there. Okay? And I will stop watching the video after that if they exceed it. And of course, I will note that video went too long. Um, but the part that you covered in the video it met the requirements of this, or you were still missing this. Go back and re-record, fix it if you want me to rewatch it again. Okay, great for capturing the ideas of an engaging special needs student. Okay, special needs students who may not be able to type on a keyboard, um, who may not, they can absolutely sit there and be awesome uh, is what they can do. And so um, I actually will do some of the videos with my special needs students, they'll stand right behind me. And so instead of them having to sit and try to figure out how to read it when, when they have oral administration for an accommodation, I'll sit here with it and treat it like a, an interview. And I'll say, hey, so-and-so, uh, you know, the question that I was asking is, what do you think about this? Now, we just prayed this and we just sang this. What do you think about this? And I'll kind of help guide them through as they share their answers and what they think and, and, and we'll do that. And they, it's really kind of cool how they get involved. Using Flipgrid is great because they get the make a selfie at the end of it. And we always do that stank face. That's what we call it, that stank face, where we just, me and my students, especially my special needs students, they do, we say, all right, give them the stank face. And we just, they just ball up their faces and really just, they take that to their own. Um, I say, have a backup because Murphy's Law reigns supreme with technology. Yes, have a backup, have a backup. The beauty about technology is, is you can tell your students if they are working at home, and of course they're having an issue with um, with their Chromebook, they can absolutely just use a cell phone device, use a tablet, use mom's computer, whatever to record it, and then just submit it to themselves, send it to themselves, or to save it to the assignment from there. And we kind of go through all that because our, our school is a Google environment, and so they know how to sign into their accounts, sign out of their accounts, and we talk about using it on external devices. Okay, using the digital citizenship, teach them to create more semi-professional videos. Teach them, yes, Okay, you did this video, it was great, but let's not do it in your pajamas where you're showing all your pajamas and we can see your Mickey Mouse. It was cute in sixth grade, but now that you're wearing the exact same pajamas in eighth grade and you've grown five inches, okay, just do it after school maybe so that and maybe just show the bust of it and not everything. You know, we talk about that, we'll joke about that if I'm talking to a student about those things, okay? And I'm sorry that my voice is giving out. Some tools to consider, Google Meet, Screencastify. I love Screencastify because it is a Chrome-based uh, I love it. It automatically saves to Google Drive. Um, when I use Seesaw, I have them posted as a link, not a video, because believe it or not, we do a three year, next year will be the third year of using Seesaw. So we'll, we'll do this next year, where they will do a reflective process at the end of the quarter on their music making over the three years. For those that have been with me for three years, for those that have only been with me for the one quarter, they'll do it over that quarter. And they'll do sort of a reflective project and, and it won't be crazy long, but it'll give them an opportunity to go back and watch these videos. Now, one of my kids, I saw him the other day, she was like, oh my gosh, like Ms. Haley, oh, I don't want to see myself last year, delete. And I was like, no, don't delete. Remember, we're going to do this project next year when you're in eighth grade. And so she's like, oh, well, I guess I can't do it. Well, she has no clue that because I teach them to use video links, she didn't delete the video. 
she deleted the link. Okay, the video is still in her Google Drive, and we'll go back and reconnect those videos next year. Uh, is what we'll do for those that chose to uh, chose to delete it. So, just a great tool, and um, and it also will help for uh, it makes the videos when you use uh, Seesaw when you share from Screen Guys and I, it'll make it viewable. Uh, and so parents can then download the videos if they want to download those artifacts of their those mom the mementos, things of that nature, of their students. Okay, and then lastly, anytime I'm um, use classroom accounts, I talked about that. 33 Mail is what um, I use. You can go check it out. Uh, if you have questions, you can call me and I'll be glad to help you. It wasn't hard at all, even to create. I created my classroom list on an Excel document, and literally, I didn't have to go through and create all those emails. I only created one email. Okay, but everything at that particular, whatever that was, I think it's like stovermusic.33 mail, anything that comes in front of that, it will send it to that one email if there's any communication from the organization. So I don't have to worry about my kids getting any kind of outside influence, organization, emails, any of that kind of stuff. I don't have to worry about that because they're using a generic account. And then lastly, if they struggle to record using online tools like Screencast device, not working, things of that nature, they can use their device cameras in order to, to do that. Whatever it is, a phone, a tablet, their, their Chromebooks, if they have it, iPads, all of those, and then upload those uh, later. And you may have some things where you, you've got something set up for it. So, um, if you want more info, feel free to connect with me. I know it was a lot. You can uh, see my resources page. Um, this is my, one of my classroom pages. It's a mess because I'm in the middle of changing it over, uh, but you can still find some of the rubrics there uh, that I showed you. And um, you can get a copy of this presentation at uh, bit.ly forward slash video creativity conf. Uh, and then um, good to go. So Richard, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. All right, great. Thank you so much, Brian. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to dig into some more of these ideas myself. Uh, I use a lot of video, but oh, and someone just popped in with a question in there. Oh, it was just a comment. It was just a thanks, Brian. I think it came from Susan. Uh, went by really quick. Uh, thank you. So I have just one quick question for you, Brian. How uh -huh. do you how do you make time to watch all the videos? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I said this earlier that I don't literally sit and play through all the videos. There are key things that I'm looking for and listening for. Um, if it's a major grade or assignment or whatnot in there, then yes, I would probably sit and watch that particular assignment for that class to do that. But for all of the things that I use them for, I'm looking for visual cues that tell me that the student is going through. For example, in the progress cues, and I don't know if I, do I still have the screen sharing on? Yep, you still got it on. Okay, so in the progress checks, there's things that I'm looking for. Um, it says the summative grade and the individual grade when they show their grades and they're doing their progress check. I'm looking for them to do that. When they're doing a lot of what this assignment is doing is making sure that parents understand that the student knows what's going on with their grade. They know what's missing. They know what, what they've turned in. They agree with this. They don't agree with this. Parents can then continue the conversation and um, parents can also respond back on uh, Seesaw, they can respond back to their students. And this is partly why I use it. This is my test classroom, so you see this is me. A parent can go in and like it, they can comment on it, um, and they can tell, and I get parents that do that all the time. They'll say, because I'll tell the kids to leave a little message for your parents, you know, tell them you want, and they would say, you can have McDonald's. So they'll go on and do that. So I don't need to, for the progress check, I don't need to go through and watch all of their videos slowly by slowly by slowly. I fast forward through it, look for those components that I know that they have, that they have communicated that, and that's how they get those five points or those 10 points for that particular video assignment. And it's a quick thing and it keeps moving fast. I actually will open all the videos and they come out um, on the top of here. And so then I'll go through and I'll watch it. And when I'm done, I exit out of it. The next one comes up, go through and watch it, exit out of it, go through and watch it, exit out of it, and just keep on going through and I'll fast forward through it. So it doesn't take a crazy amount of time. The other thing is I wouldn't schedule your big assignments for all your classes at the exact same time. I would, uh, what you call it, I would shift it and um, and have some coming in, heavier parts of some course use video when other parts are not really using the video much at all. That makes sense, that makes, that makes sense. The videos are short to begin with, so that's great. So thank you so much, Brian, and thanks to everyone who joined in to Brian's webinar, as well as all the other webinars. Big shout out to everyone who participated. Uh, thank you so much to Brian, to Art, to Tony, to Denise, to Karen, and Jeremy. Uh, you all did a bang-up job, so I really appreciate it. Uh, and once again, 
all these recordings are going to be available on YouTube as well as uh, on practicaledtech.com. And if you want uh, more information from any of the presenters, just take a look at their contact slides at the bottom there. All of them are very responsive to email, wicked responsive, as we'd say in, in New England, wicked responsive to their email, uh, very quick in responding to their email, at least in my experience. So uh, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. I hope you all learned something new and have a great winter. Uh, we got about a week left till, till winter vacation for most of us. So you can do it. We're there. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.